So it seems like more than ever, Karl Marx and the political ideology he's most associated with, communism, are hot button political talking points. Now warning against what he calls Marxist trends in America. He's actually not a socialist, he's a Marxist. This is Marxism, and Marxism is based on the belief that no person has any value as an individual. Down the list, ultra left-wing Marxists. You keep using the word. I don't know think it means what you think it means. And some US politicians have gone so far as to ban teaching topics adjacent to Marxism, while others have mandated that students spend 45 minutes of class time a year learning about the horrors of communism. I mean, in case you know where you got this, that's, that's in Florida. Well, at the risk of having someone leave a comment about how I have a hammer and sickle where my soul should be, there might still be a lot we can learn from Marx. Because contrary to what some might think, he wasn't really a dogmatic thinker. Seriously, like at all. And maybe we're at risk of getting it all wrong when we read him as the mastermind behind a grand political system. Could Marx actually help us make sense of the world we're currently living in? Let's find out in this Wisecrack edition on Marx, Deep or Dangerous? Okay, so most famous thinkers have their one big book, uh, their Bible, so to speak, which outlines the core of their big ideas. Plato has the Republic. Darwin has the origin of species. Adam McKay has stepbrothers. <laughs> and God has the literal Bible. So what about Marx? Well, it's common to think that his Bible is capital, but to really understand what Marx is doing with capital, you gotta keep at least two things in mind. First, just like that novel that I've been writing for a decade, he never finished it. It was planned as a six volume work, making him the George R.R. R. Martin of economic analysis and later pared down to a planned four volume work. But during his lifetime, he only published the first, which remains the most read, most lucid, and most referenced. And then Friedrich Engels completed the second and third volumes while Karl Kautsky published a version of the planned fourth. Now, second, if you think you're gonna understand something about communism by reading Capital, then my guy, I'm sorry. Uh, but it's not gonna work out like that. Because in blunt terms, it's not a book about communism. It's an attempt to both understand and then critique capitalism. And this is why even finance bros read capital, because it's aiming to get at the inner workings of capitalism in a purely analytical way. Now, like any compelling tale, it's centered around a central mystery, which is how is it possible for capitalists to make money? Now, obviously they own things like factories where they process raw materials like flax into something more refined like linen. They sell the linen at a profit, maybe to a different capitalist who owns a company that makes coats. Then the coat daddy sells his coats to consumers like you and me, profiting from the transaction. Framed this way, you might be thinking, yeah, duh, capitalists make money by taking a thing, adding value to it, selling it at a profit, and using that profit to make more stuff. Jeez, I don't need a dead German to figure this out. But if you step back and look at the economy as a whole, well, things start to look a bit weirder because everyone does their job to make money. And in an ideal economy, everyone is making money. While across industries, gross domestic product and other indicators are often rising, the economy is growing, as we so often say. But if the economy is constantly growing by adding money, where is all this money coming from? Because if there is more and more money being added to the economy, then it seems like someone is paying more for goods and services than they're worth. Put more simply, why isn't there a limit to profit? And if that's the case, then who is getting cheated and how? Spoiler alert, you is you. It's you and me but you too. Admit it's annoying when Bono comes around. Oh, it's the worst. Every time he says he's not hungry when we collect money for pizza and then he eats like three slices. This is Marx's starting point. As he sees problems emerging, as soon as we start asking how it's possible for the capitalist economy as a whole to produce value overall. Now his answer is simple. It's the workers, stupid. Capitalists make money by hiring workers to do a job in exchange for a wage. Let's say a worker is hired for a 10 hour shift and puts in that 10 hours making some raw materials more valuable, i.e. 10 hours of turning boring flax into desirable linens. But a smart capitalist isn't gonna pay the worker an amount that is one for one equivalent to the value of their labor produced, which would be 10 hours of work, because if they do that, then where's the profit coming from? Instead, they'll pay the worker an amount equivalent to something like eight hours of work. Now, this is necessary because to make a profit off their cloth, the capitalist must pay the worker less than the real value 
of what their labor has put into this cloth. The difference between the amount the worker is paid and the real value of their labor is called surplus value. Now, in Marx's eyes, capitalism only works because it is a giant machine for the milking of surplus value. The same goes for the appropriation of raw materials. For example, the miner will be paid less than the value of the coal they mine. In a more contemporary context, we could think about a graphic designer who's making a graphic for a company for their social media. This designer is gonna be paid less than the value of that graphic in terms of impressions, clicks, and data probably a lot less. Okay, so without workers, the capitalists couldn't make any money because they wouldn't have anyone to milk surplus value out of. At this point, we just have clear analysis and not a call to behead a banker. Now, if we cross-reference this insight with Marx and Engels' Communist Manifesto, which was published around 20 years before volume one of Capital, it becomes clear that Marx thinks a different economic system is inevitable because the bourgeoisie, which is the capitalists, need the proletariat, the workers, more than the proletariat need them. This is like saying that like your boss needs you more than you need your boss which isn't true for me. I love my boss and I need you, so thanks. Don't keep that weird kiss in this video because that felt like one of the creepiest things I've ever done on camera. And because life amongst the proletariat is generally pretty sh they're often motivated to overthrow their bosses. But this isn't an issue that capital is really concerned with. And in the book, Marx tells us absolutely nothing about what a communist society might be like. In other words, he's able to tell us precisely why the Olive Garden offers offensively bad interpretations of Italian dishes without also outlining the detailed plan for a competing chain grounded in Sicilian culinary tradition. Okay, but surely in some other book, Marx gives his detailed outline for the violent communist revolution, right? Must crush capitalism. Sorry, Jordan Peterson, because because not really. It's not a thing he does. Well, I shouldn't do anything, man, you know? Now, the manifesto does tell us what society ought to look like immediately after the working class takes power. And this is things like the abolition of property and land, a heavy progressive tax, abolition of the right of inheritance, concentration of credit in the hands of the state, etc. But this isn't meant to be a recipe for how society will end up. It's more about how the working class might be able to hold and maintain power in the present so that they have the ability to build towards a better society. Now, this is what's referred to as the dictatorship of the proletariat. Although in this case, the dictatorship language should be qualified by the fact that Marx believed the state as it presently exists is already a dictatorship of the bourgeoisie, i.e. the current system is just a dictatorship of the owners of the means of production. So basically, the dictatorship of the proletariat would settle disrupted relations to the competing interest of these two classes by coming down on the side of the proletariat across the board. In other words, rather than lots of workers making concessions to a few owners, things will be ordered wholly around what's in the best interest for the working class. I mean, it's kind of like if you had a bully in school and all the other kids get together to take down the bully, you're not going to be like, hey, Max the bully, um, we'll still let you have this, this, and that. You're like, no, there's more of us, Max. You can't bully us anymore. It's over. It's over, Max. Go home crying to your broken home which is probably the reason you're a bully in the first place because you never experienced a foundational sort of love that showed you how to love others. And by alienating you further now, we're maybe gonna make things worse for you, Max. And, and we're sorry because we're adults now and we can see what we did as kids, but we didn't know then. I got, I got sad quick and I'm, I'm sorry. Now for Marx, the dictatorship of the proletariat is not the end goal. In another text, the German ideology, written two years before the manifesto, he and Engels are very clear that it is the historical goal of the proletariat to abolish itself. This is because in capitalist society, things are increasingly divided between two classes, the bourgeoisie, and the proletariat, the bosses and the workers. When the proletariat overthrows the bourgeoisie, they will be able to establish a society in which there is only one class, as the workers will then own the means of production for themselves. It's sort of this idea that the proletariat is established via antagonism. So if you don't have that antagonism, then you don't have that separate class. You just have people who are just like doing stuff and being people. So for Marx, if there is anything that communism is, it's this. Communists want workers to own the means of production. Basically, to use a random example, Marx would want the Wisecrack team to own the channel themselves, 
which isn't isn't too wild right am i gonna get fired for saying that it's just an example and very importantly marx and engels insist that this is distinct from the state owning the means of production as this would simply turn the state into a type of universal capitalism regardless of whether or not the state insisted it was on the side of the workers and that's important because often people will say that marx wants like the state to own everything and, and he just doesn't say that um but this plan was still very loose it's an economic principle on which a society might be built, not a map for what the society will actually look like. And importantly, it's not a plan written by a political strategist or military leader, but theoretical analysis and criticism written by an academic and journalist, largely from within the confines of his family home. And this is a pretty big departure from those who speak about Marx as if he had a blueprint to radicalize your children and put all the businessmen into work camps after he got done burning down churches. In his late essay, Critique of the Gotha Program, Marx tells us that the guiding slogan of the communist society will be from each according to their ability to each according to their needs. So there is certainly some indication that freed from the capitalist profit motive, we will all work together for the good of all. Marx and Engels also indicate in the German ideology that under communism, people will be free to choose their jobs and not forced to specialize as we do under capitalism. Where there's a strict division of labor, for instance, uh, in a factory where workers might perform one distinct task all day long. As Marx describes it, for me to do one thing today and another tomorrow, to hunt in the morning, fish in the afternoon, rear cattle in the evening, criticize after dinner, just as I have a mind without ever becoming a hunter, fisherman, herdsman, or critic. So there is an indication that there would be greater scope for individual spontaneity and free expression under communism. But again, this is just a very loose description of what Marx is hoping for. The main point is that he wants a world where people spend more time being humans and less time being workers. If you want to spend more time being a worker, let me know in the comments. Look at that. The cots go out full, but they come in empty. It's criminally inefficient. Quiet, mate. Hole in the empty cars is the closest thing we get to sleep. But don't you see? They could increase efficiency 4% if they use the empty cots to bring in heavy mining machinery. Hey, I like the way you think. <laughs> And while we're not going to go through the whole list now, it's also worth noting that many of Marx's most referenced texts were incomplete or went unpublished in his lifetime. And in this way, they represent his in-process thinking more than they do completed systems. So does the incomplete theoretical nature of Marx's writings mean we should take him less seriously? Well, we actually think it's the opposite. As the in-process and incomplete nature of much of his work is what's so beautiful about Marx. Besides that gorgeous beard and hair combo, of course. But that beard probably smelled like We see this in another definition of communism, this time from the German ideology. Communism is for us not a state of affairs which is to be established. An ideal to which reality will have to adjust itself. We call communism the real movement which abolishes the present state of things. Here, Marx and Engels are making it clear that communism is not some ready-made system to be put together like IKEA furniture. Instead, it's an ideal, and hopefully a movement which could create a new world. It's also worth remembering that Marx and Engels were materialist, operating with a materialist method. This means that its premises are men, not in any fantastic isolation and rigidity, but in their actual empirically perceptible process of development under definite conditions. As soon as this active life process is described, history ceases to be a collection of dead facts as it is with the empiricist or an imagined activity of imagined subjects as with the idealist. Now, this means that for a Marxist, it doesn't make sense to establish an abstract and ideal sense of what communism is. For Marx and Engels, materialist thinking starts from the concrete lives and conditions of existing human beings. This means analyzing what people have, what they lack, and what they need, and ultimately using that as a starting point to think about how things could be different. So to be a Marxist today doesn't mean to agree with what Marx said about his society. It's to use his method to analyze what's going on today. Though Lord knows, I, I think Marx would have just had a field day with cryptocurrency and the gig economy. This materialist method is what Marx did or at least tried to do. Though of course, he was super wrong in many of his predictions about how things would develop. 
For example, the proletariat and industrial nations like the UK and the US never banded together to overthrow the bourgeoisie. Oops, well, we'll try better next time. But this is why Marx is so useful today. Whether we're philosophers, sociologists, political theorists, or just curious individuals interested in understanding what's wrong with the world today for the sake of figuring out how to make things better. In more reductive terms, Marx has always required us to add some of our own ingredients. Like a taco flavoring packet that needs some beef before we can really do a proper Taco Tuesday. Taco Tuesday! But that's the fun part, as Marx's thought is a critical flavoring that we get to use to analyze our world in the here and now. It's not being scolded by some bearded 19th century weirdo about how we should be living. He wasn't arguing for a world where some humans ruled over others. He simply wanted to imagine a world where everyone would just get to be human. What a crazy idea. But what do you guys think? Does making Marx more boring actually make him more interesting? Does it make sense to be a Marxist in 2023? Or is there a hidden code in his books that outlines a horrific theory of fascist violence? Let us know in the comments. A huge shout out to this video's researcher, Tom Wyman. He wrote a book that's about Marx that introduces one of his texts. I will put a link in the description, but you can check that out. Guy knows what he's talking about. He also wrote some other books, which are good too. Um, besides Tom, thanks to our patrons for being a part of our little, I don't know, working class collection of people that have enough money to support a YouTube channel that then gives them some content early and we, we hang in discord and stuff like that but thanks to all of you out there who watch the videos who like subscribe comment um and thanks for letting us explore ideas like this because it's fun and thanks in advance for all the totally mellow comments um i will see you next time oops i hit the mic oh i hit it oh no is that my coworker? did i did i hit my coworker? call hr he's hitting the mic I swear to God.